All right, all right. Happy Tuesday, everyone. It's so exciting to be here talking about pizza. I'm like already ready for a party. I did actually just have some last night. I was thinking about getting an extra big slice from the local shop here called Lazy Moon, but I was like, that's going to be too big on the screen. Um, it might be a little disproportionate. Um, today we have Michael Perello here with us. Michael, uh, welcome. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Absolutely. So I'm a principal solutions architect. Uh, been doing data analytics now about 20 years. So, you know, well more than that, right? Um, and how long have that, you been a pizza fan for? Oh, just... Uh, if I date my age, right, you know, for, <laughs> forever. Um, yeah, but, you know, as you get older now, that problem is, you know, kind of becoming a little bit lactose intolerant. So, you know, part of, uh, you know, this whole data journey that I went on, you know, when you start doing selected pizza, um, make sure you, you get the right one because, uh, you know, it, it's probably going to hurt. Um, afterwards, and you want to make sure it at least tastes good if you're going to go down that road. Um, yeah, so I, I found a whole bunch of good, useful information. We'll get into, you know, that kind of discussion. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to kind of share my findings. Awesome. And have you talked to me about like your your favorite type of pizza? Are you more like a traditional type? You got you deep there's dish. there's two go-tos so, okay. so i am uh for the most part strictly like new york style um new york style, new york style. and my two go-tos i know this is probably going to offend a lot of people is the hawaiian ham and pineapple and just the traditional pepperoni so nice. those are my my two go-to occasionally i'll get the craving for the hawaiian and i'm okay with that i admit it it, it's good. I like it. <laughs> yeah, it's funny because I actually did see quite a bit of data talking about the Hawaiian style uh, pizza and like that, just literally people being honed in on that. Um, I grew up in Colorado and ironically, that was a pretty common thing there. So it's interesting to see yeah. how it, it, it upsets two camps some people, up. you know, ham and pineapple do not belong on a pizza. Well, I think we should have done maybe a pizza study for international pizza, right? There you go. Next time. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, so let's dive in here. Um, I know you've got an interesting set to kind of give in terms of, of pizza, right? So we've yeah. got a, a slide and we're going to... A slide or is this a slice? Is this a slice of... Of your data Slice set of data. Here. Yeah. So, so my whole thought process around this was, you know, just as with any kind of data, when we talk about transformation is, you know, where, where are we getting the data? So my whole thing about the, the pizza thing was, you know, finding kind of pizza reviews. Um, mm. And okay, you know, I could do some Google searches and, you know, look at the various places uh, online, uh, data repos. Uh, for all that. And I wanted it to be, you know, pretty widespread, uh, at least all US based um, across, not just, you know, New York or Chicago or, you know, where your traditional, you know, uh, maybe styles of pizza might reign a little bit higher, but uh, pretty much anywhere. Hmm. And the next one, you know, once I, I had an idea of where my data was, uh, you know, what kind of tools would I use to uh, procure the data to curate it, cleanse it, do all that, and then kind of do the analysis. Um, mm -hmm. And then going through that whole thing, if it, it was actually a lot more challenging than I thought. I, I knew where I wanted to get my data, and I was like, it's there. You know, th this is going to be easy. I'm going to knock out this presentation in like 10 minutes. Not a big deal. Um, <laughs> you know, like eight hours into the thing, you know, trying to play with the data and wrestle it and, you know, finding out that all the data necessarily isn't there. Um, 
you know, that just kind of goes to show you, even working in, uh, you know, the enterprises and with organizations, uh, just because you think you have all the data doesn't necessarily mean it's all there to answer the questions people have. And even though you also may have it, um, it may not be in the right format or the, the syntax. And, you know, this is where the whole kind of ELT, ETL, you know, data cleansing, um, prepping, you know, kind of comes into place. And we still spend a lot of time uh, making sure that the data looks right to be presented um, in a good format. And I spent way, way too much time. But it, it was a good exercise, and that's, that's kind of what I want to talk about today. Yeah, I think that's talking about wrestling, right? It feels more like you're trying to make a, a breadstick, right, than mm -hmm. actually roll out the pizza. And every time we go through these exercises, uh, somehow I always find myself being like, oh yeah, there's probably plenty of pizza workflows out there, right, um, to work with. And like I had mentioned, it, it sends you off on these wild tangents with uh, Hawaiian <laughs> expeditions for pizza. Um, there was lots of stuff there with Python. Um, yeah. uh, but as we kind of talk about uh, these different topics, it's kind of interesting to see um, what really bubbles up to the surface in terms of ingredients, et cetera, um, for us to make these uh, really cool uh, pies here. Exactly. Um, yeah, so, so, you know, in my data set search, um, you know, I'm, I'm a fan. I, I, I watch, uh, you know, this, this web show, uh, One Byte, uh, mm. you know, that's a show that's basically put on by uh, Dave Portnoy, uh, you know, owner operator of Barstool Sports. But uh, basically daily he goes out different places, travels, um, tries these, you know, local mom and pop shops um, and then rates them. So if you go mm -hmm. out to the website, onebyte.app, uh, you can kind of get a sense of, you know, what's out there. Uh, you can actually find pizza in your area, watch reviews, order pizza, leave reviews yourself, which is great. Um, I live out in the Phoenix area, and there is a few good places, but by and large, it's a lot of chains and mm. not so great, uh, you know, pizzas as well. Um, and uh, like I said, you know, when I when I go out visit places, I want to make sure that, you know, eating local. If I'm going to hurt later, I want to make sure it's going to be worthwhile. So yeah. So that that was kind of my whole thing. Um, now, if you go to the website, you know, again, you can kind of see what it's about. He's got his video reviews and some information. We'll, we'll get to that in a little bit. But what I found in doing some research was, OK, where can I get all of this data from? And I found several places. One, they, they do have a public API, which is great. Most of the data uh, is there, maybe not historically going back, you know, many, many years. but you know, for the most part, it, it's pretty good. And the availability of the fields that you might want to look for to make some decisions on the venue, the location, the date and time mm -hmm. of the review, um, you know, some commentary and some things like that. All of that seemed to be great. The problem with the API that I found when I was doing some testing was there's an offset and limit. So for every okay. request that I made, it was only pulling back, you know, 40, 50 records or so at a time. Yeah. Now you can get around that through some other coding, you know, some IP address changes and other types mm -hmm. of kind of round robin. And my whole thing for this exercise was, look, I, I don't want to code. I don't want to use some expensive applications. Again, the data's right there. I want to make this super <laughs> easy. I want to take my data and what we'll go through tomorrow, you know, when we start doing the kind of visualization side, let's see what this data actually looks like. Um, and if I'm spending way too much time prepping and analyzing the data, that wasn't my goal. So yeah. I sidestepped that pretty quick. I was like, you know what, I'm not going to get involved, I'm not going to get, you know, any of the colleagues involved to try to do this. Let's see what else is out there. <laughs> so I, I found some already pre made data on some websites. Um, and on some people's GitHub pages. But the problem was, it was static data. Um, mm -hmm. 
and it was subsets of data. You know, maybe some people were looking at just the data in their local city, or maybe it was only a subset of data from several years ago. So it wasn't fresh. Yeah. Um, and that's a problem. So, and again, kind of data selective. Um, maybe it didn't uh, connect everything. So maybe not the address of the venue or the city or state. So it, it was all over the place. And again, I kind of ditched that option as well. And I just kept going back to the website. The website had everything I needed. Um, okay. You know, unfortunately, there was no way, if you go to the website and look at all the videos, there is no download option. There's no say, hey, get the data here. <laughs> um, and just like we, we saw last week with, uh, you know, Robert's presentation, it's like, hey, you know, there, there's a lot of things that you can do with like Excel and Google Sheets to just input a URL yeah. and scrape the data. Super easy. And I've done that before. And I was like, okay, this is going to be a cakewalk again, you know, 10 minutes and I'm done. Okay. <laughs> not, again, not, not so easy sometimes. And that was a problem. So, you know, if you go to the website, you know, one byte app, you know, click on Dave, um, you'll kind of see just his reviews. And again, everything's there as far as the, as far as the elements that I wanted. I just wanted to focus on his reviews. If you click into, uh, a review topic, um, you can actually get a subset of data like I'm showing up on my screen. You know, the additional information, phone number and address, user reviews, which can be great um, and important, but I just wanted to focus on kind of the core information, the review link, the Dave score itself, the venue, city, state, um, you know, and, and when it was done. Yeah. So the data is there. Um, now, the way the web page is constructed, this was where it was problematic. So when we start talking about the different products that I use to test, again, we know that Excel can actually go out and grab data, Google Sheets, same mm -hmm. thing. Um, and there's you know, a million and one um, apps on the internet and extensions and so forth. I, I just picked a couple that we get, went through. So let's kind of talk about that. I know last week uh, we saw Excel being used to scrape some data. Um, yeah. Again, super easy. You plug in the URL and Excel nine times out of 10 will just go out and magically give you the data and it's there. Um, in this case, not so much. Um, you know, it kind of came back with this document table and within that, you know, some element information. And talk. Problem is, is the construct of that web page is not a table. Um, you know, it looks like one, you get the grids, all that, but it's actually, you know, just a bunch of div tags styled to make it look nice and neat and some JavaScript to actually layer in the information. So again, this was like, Hey, <laughs> making it very difficult, you know, for me just to try to, you know, grab your data. What's, what's going on? Exactly. So, it's not as easy as ordering pizza, right? No, it's not. It should... Um, and so you know, I did kind of research this a little bit more and I found, you know what, you're gonna to have to do some transformations. We gotta go into Power Query and do all that stuff. And again, once I started, you know, reading this, I got totally annoyed and it's like, you know what, again, I just want the data. I don't wanna to have to learn a new skill right now. <laughs> that, that's not my goal. So uh, I got rid of that. Now the next one is uh, Google Sheets. So Google Sheets um, actually has a import HTML uh, function, which mm. nine times out of 10, again, you use that kind of syntax and it just works. The problem yes. is, is it's not HTML again, in the sense that uh, you know, you're know you using constructs, the code um, to create a table or table elements. So mm -hmm. this was where uh, you know I had to use an import XML. Um, which was a little different because in that you actually have to write some XPath, you know, and, you know, you guys can Google it and read, but, you know, the whole point of XPath is to kind of identify the class or the construct of the actual elements attribute. And after probably an hour or so working with another colleague, it was just like, again, you know, I'm gonna have to learn a new skill and go in and kind of relearn some coding and, you know, that wasn't for me, but it did produce a little bit of data, 
but not the whole thing. Again, if you look on the website, you know that there's pagination on the pages. You get a, so many reviews per page before you have to click next, next, and next. Um, and you'd have to do quite a bit of coding and manipulation um, in Google Sheets to actually iterate through. So that wasn't for me. It was There was some data coming through. Obviously, you can tell it's not formatted um, or structured in a nice, easy way for me to interpret and transfer to any kind of data structure uh, without additional work. So. Sorry. Yeah, and I think <laughs> when we're talking about data transformation as a whole, right, th this initial part, I feel, is where there's a lot of trouble, like just getting started off the blocks, right? It makes you feel like a runner because you're so anxious, like you talked about getting started. Oh, man, it's only 100 meters, right, that I have to run or like a 50-yard a dash, right? Like I can easily make this happen. But the catch is I've just got to be off the blocks, perfect timing, right? And then everything else will kind of come together. And I think that's something when we, especially when we're looking at all these sources that are available online, um, it's not necessarily as clean to be able to, to go there and gather these. So as we're kind of discussing some of these topics, what I would like to invite the audience to share is maybe different sources that they have for data around pizza. and then. If you guys would like data sources, right, please throw that in the chat because um, we're actually playing with some different ideas about hosting uh, public data sets um, on Snowflake so everybody can access them for free. Yeah, and that's super important. Um, you know, we, we go out there and I know you've got, you know, something to share, you know, on data.world and there's all these things, but, you know, mostly we, when you're using this kind of data, you need to make sure that you can trust it, you understand the background, kind of the entirety of the data set itself, freshness, accuracy. Um, and all the data that I kind of went through, again, was subsets of data, stale data, old data. So it wasn't really relevant. And I know, you know, it's like, who cares about pizza data? But, you know, correlate that to anything else, right? In healthcare, finance, um, supply chain, whatever it might be. Um, so having these marketplaces of readily available data that you can trust and it's already curated and cleansed, um, everybody would love that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so Web Scraper IO, this is pretty sweet. It looks like it's got a nice setup. It, it is. So the nice thing about this is it's actually a plugin, so or an extension that you can plug into Chrome or Firefox. Nice. Um, you know, it is it is free. Uh, you will probably most likely need to run through the video tutorials, which actually are pretty fantastic. Um, and I just have a, a screenshot of kind of what I went through to create that. The nice thing about this, again, um, it's logical. Um, so when you start creating the sitemap, you know, think of the sitemap as that, you know, uh, initial website that you want to look at, and then it will start to traverse all the child. Uh, pages within it. Once you get to that point, you can start constructing through you know, the visual uh, click-throughs um, what kind of elements you want. And again, you know, if you're not familiar with how to do web scraping, the tutorials on this were pretty intuitive and easy. It's, it's built right into the browser, so it just worked. Um, now, the challenge, again, with this website is, is OK, everything's kind of there. You can iterate through the pages. Um, but in order to get to the deeper level of information, you actually have to click into a review. Remember how I, I presented at the kind of the first couple of slides? You had the phone number, the address, and user reviews, and, and some other things. That's not at the parent level. So in order to get that, you know, it was a little more challenging with Web Scraper IO um, to get to that level of granularity. If all I wanted was just Dave's reviews, you know, this is my yeah, winner. Straight forward. Um, this was yeah. super easy. I knocked this out probably in, a, in about five minutes after watching maybe a half hour of tutorials. Um, nice. Super fun. And then we've got an export right there. Um, put it out to a CSV, opened it up, everything's kind of right there. My title, my, uh, or the venue name, I guess, um, the link to the 
image and the video, the score, location, uh, the verified user, and the date timestamp. So all the data that I wanted to grab, um, again, super easy. So I'm happy with this. But if I did want that other subset of data, the user reviews and the phone number and the full address, um, this didn't quite make the cut. I, I got the data, but it wasn't as easy. So then I found this other tool, um, Octoparse, uh, which is a thick client application. You can download it, install it. Uh, but this, by and far, was the easiest. It was um, nice. basically click, click, click. Um, I watched, I think, one or two videos. Um, but this was almost like when you, when you hear like Alteryx, right? You know, low code, no code. This was really just a click, click, click. I was done in like 10 minutes. Um, you know, for the core data and then the data underneath it. So uh, for me, this is, you know, the clear winner. But the flexibility that Web Scraper had to actually just be built into the browser, that was actually really it's nice convenient. and convenient. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I think I do want us to start even exploring when we talk about transformation, right? I know this is more on the extraction side of things, but when we discuss this, I mean, part of it is just literally making uh, data usable. And when we look at this in totality, right, we want to make sure that we're able to uh, kind of dive into some of those things again so we can just extract the data. Yeah. Um... You know, the second part of this, uh, you know, will be, hey, I want to visualize this data. And while we have a lot of the data elements now, we don't necessarily have everything that I'd need to kind of paint that big picture. Um, mm -hmm. As an example, we start to do transformations. Uh, we're going to see tomorrow where we're going to have this data visualized in uh, Tableau dashboard. And we want to also see some mapping data. The problem is, is Tableau and, and a lot of other tools just don't um, map based off of the actual location, you know, a physical address. Yeah. So we'd have to, in, you know, bring in some data to reverse uh, geocode uh, the address to a latitude, longitude, and, you know, blend that or join that up to the actual data itself. Um, and then there's some subset of data, again, like I said, the user reviews. We want to marry up, clean up. Um, but we also want to do some uh, analysis to make sure that those user reviews are actually, I don't want to say real people, but real reviews. <laughs> you know, how many times do you go in and it's like super positive reviews or um, just totally bomb negative? Um, yeah. And you look at them and it's like, those don't look like real accounts or they're one offs. And so when we do these types of uh, analysis, we need to make sure that the data that we're including, um, again, is really painting a truer picture. So yeah. we're, we're not even close to being done. We've got a good set of data, but depending on the analysis that we're trying to do, we, we may be uh, bringing in additional data and doing some assessments as, as we'll kind of see more tomorrow on you know, where this actually takes us. And did you feel like you had any issues bringing in this data? I mean, in terms of once you created the CSV file, like. So I, I will tell you, and and I think we we chatted about this a little bit earlier. Some of these files, when you're doing parsing, will contain the original code structure as well as a field. Yeah. So. You know, we saw, what was it? Um, let me just kind of circle back. What do we got, six fields that I'm looking mm -hmm. for? It, it's not yeah. a lot. And you can think, OK, even if you had, you know, like 1,200 reviews or 1,500 reviews, it's still not, you know, a large amount of data. We're not looking into hundreds of megabytes or anything. But when you start lo looking at, uh, the way that these tools parse out data. Um, mm -hmm. If you ever look at a website, you know, look at the actual code behind it. It's not pretty, um, and it could be, <laughs> you know, thousands, if not millions, of lines of code, and it and it 
it again, it's ugly mess. And occasionally that gets brought in or a subset of that data gets brought in into that parse, um, into yeah. the actual file. So when I'm thinking that, hey, these files are going to be small, one of the tools, actually a couple of the tools, they were exploding the data. So each file, and you think of a file as like one page, if you have yeah. 40 pages of data, you know, they were upwards up to 60 megabytes each. <laughs> Seriously? So these are that. things where we have to be careful to make sure what data is actually brought in and, you know, what, what should we omit before we actually do that uh, extraction. I actually had that problem whenever I was working for the vitamin company a, a long time ago um, because literally we were doing scraping and stuff off of Amazon. Um, that's not even as readily available now, but just the sheer depth that some of those have, like you got images, you've got ratings, right? You've got what's the recommended products. Um, and then they even have like subcategories that were, uh, nested in there, so it's it's pretty intense. Um, it is. But yeah. yeah, I definitely feel like the tools have come a long way to do some of that, like auto parsing, and it it almost feels like you were talking about it's it's either perfect and it just whoosh, like your use case just sails right through, or oh man, I'm gonna have to sit here and and grind it out for a bit. Yeah, and I think that's having you know product knowledge and understanding what the tools are capable of doing um again we, we could have probably thrown that api into alteryx and mm -hmm. you know uh, cleansed out you know all the data you know pretty quick um but that wasn't the goal you know not everybody's got you know uh, an application like that and for anyone out there that knows oh hey i can do this in excel or google sheets pretty easily in most cases yeah but that that didn't turn out that way and you know i I want to say I found out the hard way, but you know I, I didn't expect to spend so, so much time, you know, doing some product tool evaluation to just get data that I wanted. Well, what's interesting is like, did you feel? Because it looks like you have Tableau Prep up here. Mm -hmm. Do you feel if you didn't have the file that you could have just grabbed the data set via like a web connector? Do you think it would have pulled that in on its own or? <laughs> Yeah, so in Tableau Prep, and this is also the challenge, you know, it doesn't have, you know, a web data connector, you know, feature. Now you can build those out um, and customize that. But again, you know, that wasn't my goal. I wasn't looking mm -hmm. to do something custom. It also yeah. doesn't have natively an API connector. Now mm -hmm. in Tableau Prep, you can actually use like TabPy to write some Python code to go out, um, talk to the API and bring that in. Mm -hmm. But that would require me to then stand up like a TabPy server. And again, <laughs> not something that I <laughs> had the luxury just to spin up and do. But all of this could have been possible. Um, and, yeah. and it is, you know, uh, a definite solution in your organization. If you've got these uh, products deployed, um, this might be uh, an easy go to thing. Hey, you've got that working. Let's set up a script uh, tag you can actually see here. Um, I've got the script so I can connect to an API through that. That'll pass through like a TabPy server, bring in the data. I can cleanse nice. it. If you've got Alteryx, you've got the download tool, you can do all that. So there, there's a lot of ways that we could have done this. It's just I didn't have them accessible to me at the time. Yeah, and I think when we're talking about rap rapid prototyping, right? So like if we're envisioning like, hey, if I'm going to be sharing this right right now, this is probably initial share where it's ad hoc. So there's not too many concerns to get started, right? It's, hey, we just need to see, is there anything in here worth looking at um, right. from the one byte reviews? Or, I mean, you said literally he's posting them all the time. So we may want an ongoing evaluation or it could be um, like the, uh, different reviewing uh, platforms that you see like um, in relation to Zagat, right? Or um, doing Yelp reviews or um, what's the other one that I'm thinking? Oh, it has a spoon. I want to say Urban Spoon, but uh, that's something different. Yeah. Um, so as you're kind of looking at those, right? I think that's part of the reason why you see those books come out once a year 
but especially right now when I look at like COVID, right? Um, it really changed the game because when you look at menus in totality and we're, as you're talking about evaluating some of these things, are the pizzas even the same, right? That they were from a seasonality perspective. Now you see a lot of restaurants going to a very small menu and then you even have pop-up ones. So if you were to have kind of this idea of, hey, what should I go look at that's local, right? They may not even have the product that you're looking for when you actually go there to visit. No, uh, and that's a good point. You see that all the time now, uh, kind of downsizing in menus, portions, um, availability of you know certain menu items as well. Yeah. And that's one of the things that we noticed. Um, kind of going back to this data, you know, the one thing that it doesn't show in the data at all, nor does it have, is kind of the style of pizza. You know, you talked about like kind of, you know, the mm. Chicago deep dish, um, St. Louis style, New York, whatever it might be. You know, if I want to avoid, you know, I'm not a huge fan of, you know, deep dish. If I want to avoid that, you know, there's nowhere in these reviews unless I'm kind of doing text analysis in the comments to search for keywords. I've got no yeah. idea what kinds they are. And if they don't have pictures, you know, that makes things, you know, a little bit tougher too. I got to go based off of just a score, which, you know, kind of subjective. Well, I mean, we haven't come up with a pizza analyzer app yet where you like run your phone over it and it magically tells you. <laughs> like even distribution of <laughs> uh, the, the, unbiased the, the analysis. Opportunity. There you go. Exactly. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that's what I got. Um, and then, like I said, tomorrow we'll uh, we'll share the visualization and kind of see some, uh, hopefully, some good trends and analysis based off of uh, you know where people might live and kind of those user reviews as well. You've got some really cool pie charts for that, right? Absolutely not. <laughs> I will not go there. I don't care, I don't care I, what the theme is. <laughs> I've never heard of a, a pizza bar before, so we'll have to see uh, see some some interesting ones going on there. That's right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So let's kind of dive in here. I've got a couple different ones um, that I'm going to review. Um, the first one is actually just a weekly challenge. Um, and this one was interesting because it literally talked about uh, meal deals. Um, so I'm actually in here. Um, this is, just so everyone's aware, this is actually um, 21.4, which just dropped last week. Um, so I'll point out a couple new features as we're kind of going through um, the Altrix platform and this workflow. So let me zoom in here so we can see what this workflow actually is. This actually went really far back. So I was a little disappointed. I was expecting a little bit more uh, pizza love from the Altrix community, um, but this went all the way back to weekly challenge one. So Michael, this, this will probably date my career back with Altrix. I remember it was probably like, uh, about a half dozen years or so in before they came out with the weekly challenges. And I was like, oh, this is pretty cool. So I remember yeah. working on the first handful of them. And when we look at this, right, um, you can see they're talking about um, literally just gathering information around meal deals, right? So with this data, it's back in 2013. Um, so they didn't have all the different cheeses that people were worried about. Uh, lactose intolerant, right? Like Daya cheese or some oat milk cheese, right? Um, free. Exactly. Cauliflower crust. <laughs> so you got straight up old school pizza versus burger, right? With a side or a drink. And then what's interesting about this is um, really here was just trying to determine the, the workflow itself was trying to determine um, whether or not you would order a meal with a pizza or a drink, or sorry, with a drink or a side dish, right? So when we look at this from a POS perspective, it literally had in here all the sales, how much they were. So you can see maybe some mozzarella sticks, um, jalapeno poppers, onion rings, 
right? And then you've got the pizzas here. There's your Mount Hawaiian. Um, and then we got barbecue chicken, right? That might catch another handful of people off guard with the barbecue. Um, so like, as we look at this, right, there's a nice breakdown in terms of menu items. And if we're looking at this holistically, um, if you haven't seen this within the Altrix platform, again, there's some great statistics here. So if we wanted to see the descriptions, we could literally see what that breakdown is. So it looks like everybody's all obviously ordering a large and small soda. That's almost dead even, which is kind of interesting. If I were looking at this from like an owner perspective, that's something that I'd be trying to push the upsell, right? So it's not that people aren't buying them, it's literally, are they buying the size that we want them to? Um, and then when we look at this, right? Um, so we see quarter pounder down here at the bottom. Ah, looks like the buffalo chicken isn't that popular, right? But if we scroll up here to the top and let's see, uh, meat grinders up here at the top and the works. So it's just like a, a loaded baked potato, right? That everybody wants their pizzas kind of piled high. Um, so it's interesting. You should see like Colorado or something with a, a mile high pizza, right? That literally it looks like stacked like a pile of nachos. Maybe it's because the crust wouldn't cook, right? The, they haven't done that yet. You know, um, back in uh, high school, I, I actually worked for a pizza place and you know, that, that was our thing um, every night. You know, we'd, we'd get a little thing to take home. And, you know, that was that was the goal is pile up the toppings <laughs> as high as you can. And, you know, just from experience, that is not a good good way to go. Um, <laughs> there's a reason why like you have the... a limited amount of toppings. You know, you think that, hey, just throw everything, mash it up there and cook it. Uh, They'd have to, painful. like, shove a, a heater in the middle, right, to kind of, like, do the heat dispersion kind of going out exactly yeah, yeah that's interesting yeah it's it's funny because you're talking about that um we used to do something similar but i used to work at uh cold stone um so i ran a few cold stones back in the day and you did pile on the the um candy and stuff in there but i don't <laughs> think that was to any discredit right because at that point you're probably reducing the amount of dairy and uh i remember i I used to be able to, I definitely can't anymore. Uh, I used to be able to pound down half a gallon of ice cream uh, at night after dinner. And I, I cannot do that anymore. So like even a whole pizza, that that thought just scares me. Um, yeah. I think the closest- it's like, do I... you want a little bit of ice cream on your toppings? Maybe exactly. <laughs> exactly. And it's crazy because I did try and do for my 31st birthday, I literally did 31 flavors of ice cream. Um, so I did like one each day and did it for a whole month. Um, and there, there are some good ones and there are definitely some bad ones. So uh, fries and ice cream is an example, right? Um, they don't freeze very well. Like it's good fresh, but yeah, don't try it already pre-frozen. So, yeah. um, so as we kind of look at this data, right? What are some things that you, that you should try pre-made versus um, doing them on the fly? So as we kind of talk about this, right? Um, the joins um, going in here and lining up the type. So that was literally just lining up. If we're looking at, hey, is this part of like a combo meal, right? Versus being an individual uh, component, then we can identify, oh man, that seems a little pricey for, a Mount Hawaiian, right? 14 bucks. Um, this is back in 2013. We'd be like, yeah, that's a pretty good deal right now. Um, <laughs> so when we look at these, right, we may want to gather some of that information. You can see there's a date parse here. Um, and then this is always what, something when I look at data transformations that's tricky is what's the best way to kind of pivot your data? And I think each platform has its own way of handling this and then also has its own way of kind of scaling this, right? So when we talk about this um, with Altrix, it uses multi-threading. Um, if you haven't seen it before, oh man, I was like, did my wife actually get rid of it? Um, she hates my little uh, placemat, but this is the Altrix periodic table of tools. Um, and if you see like these little red dots that are kind of around here, those are blocking tools. And then the ones with the yellow actually have multi-threading. So you can see that there's a transformation ones here 
and those are literally blocking tools um, because it has to perform all of the calculations at once before it lets any data move past it. Um, not all platforms are like this. Some use multi-threading, right? And then we'll allow the records to kind of trickle in, but it depends on what that aggregation, et cetera, is, which you can see down here. So as we kind of talk about this, literally it was kind of pivoted on the tickets, right? And you can see, hey, let's look at the meal deals, right? And then grab the flag to determine whether or not it was a meal. And then when we look at this, the original workflow essentially had the summarization where um, they took the total number in terms of counts, right? And then as we transition over, what were the potential? And then if we calculated this out, what does that look like? So about 70% were actually meal deals, right? That's honestly, that's pretty good. Um, so I would assume they don't have a lot of takeout, right? Which if I were looking at this today, I'd wanna do pre and post COVID, right? Yeah. Um, and then analyze that with COVID kind of in the middle. So, hey, what were, what was I at before? So I know when we're kind of coming out of this, um, if I'm hiring staff, et cetera, what should I be getting them to push and what should those numbers look like? Um, which honestly, everybody probably wants a soda or something extra because they haven't had it in a while. So we should actually be seeing an uptick in those. Um, or maybe some extra toppings, right, Michael? And, maybe well, and, even... and you kind of talked about it earlier too, right? The, um, I guess the innovation of kind of this ordering process, you know, post COVID. Yeah. You know, everything is all customizable now. If, you know, you go on your phone app and it's like, yeah, you can still get your pre-made anything's pizza, um, but everything is personalized now. You know, you can customize it saves your order it'll provide you the recommendations you know hey other people that you know order this also ordered that um so all these recommendation engines you know even kind of come into play through the whole ordering process to try to get you to upsell buy other things and you know we, we can see that you know it's kind of like analytics. the Chipotle methodology right with fast yeah. casual absolutely and it's crazy because i'm thinking of uh a chain that we frequent here actually and it's it's crazy not only do they let you like pick the crust and dairy free cheese versus regular right but you can even order a half pizza at blaze pizza so if you only want half you want a pizza and a salad right because you always get stuck where you're like i should be a little healthier but i don't want to be right <laughs> you can literally order half a pizza and they'll throw it in the oven for you and you don't even have to like split uh the Hawaiian versus pepperoni argument, right? So that's cool. Yeah. Um, and so when we look at some of the transformation here, like what are some of the things uh, that weren't clear um, as we're kind of breaking this down, right? Um, when we're talking about the, the 70%, um, it was a little tricky just to kind of see within the, the data set at first, right? Like, okay, is this technically two orders of onion rings, um, like some of the things that I was looking at here. So they ordered a small and a large, right? Um, when I look for upselling opportunities, I'd almost want to know, like, was there an extra large, et cetera? So it was kind of interesting to see um, when we're looking at this, right? There were no prices um, associated here with any of that information. Um, and I would have liked to have seen that. So maybe if the price has changed over time, and we are aggregating that information, especially with supply chain uh, changes that could even be adjusting like month over month or week to week or even location to location, right? Um, so I think that was one piece that I'd really call out. Um, and then in regards to the transformation, right? Calculation here, um, being able to see the 70% was good. If you've ever done these uh, weekly challenges, it's meant to be quick and dirty. Um, so I think it's kind of interesting to see this. And then when we look at these, right, um, the different toppings. So I'd almost want to see when we're looking at this, um, an enrichment, uh, maybe in terms of like, this was a lookup table, probably an internal lookup table. I'd almost want to see, um, do we have something from our vendor? So that's actually what I did when I was at the uh, vitamin company is we actually took all of our vendor lists and 
I, w I didn't even really care so much about what we were selling today. That that was good information. We had a greater depth there. But because e-commerce or online ordering moves so quickly, right? What is some of the information that I can gather from external and then compare? So let's say I were doing your scrape off of one bite, right? And this was my menu. What could I see that people are raving about? Maybe it's like Emil's talking about, hey, I want impossible pepperoni or beyond sausage, right? How do I get that on my pizza? If people are willing to pay extra for that, like those prices, like we were talking about, right? Yeah. Um, or maybe they want a side of mozzarella sticks. How can we kind of make that um, dream happen, right? If people are willing to pay for it, I think we can go for it. Yeah, and that's, we always kind of joke here in, you know, uh, Phoenix in our user group, you know, about, you know, the kind of the external data, mm -hmm. uh, you know, everything that you kind of t tie in, it's like, hey, just bring in moon phase data, you know, you're going <laughs> to see some absolutely amazing things, you know, but, you know, in past organizations where we worked like, uh, you know, casino and gaming, hospitality and things like that, you know, weather data is, you know, ultimately critical. Oh, yeah. um, you know, you know, I kind of joke about the moon phase data, but, you know, when we look at certain dates on the calendar, you know, we find that, oh, hey, this is, you know, the day that people are getting their paychecks or social security or, you know, some yes. other things. And we see upticks in attendance and spending and maybe different events, you know, something going on throughout the valley or concerts or whatever there might have been is we know when things are going to happen. We know what the after effect is going to be. It's going to be an uptick in, you know, sales on more pizzas and sodas and things like that. So external data analysis is super important, I think. I was going to ask you, you know, as you started kind of talking about all these scenarios, what is your approach to kind of developing out the workflow more? Is it to mm. kind of create this one big giant workflow or as scenarios come in, just taking subsets of that data and, you know, kind of going through the motion just to get to that one data set? That's actually a great question. Um, I think for me personally, I do the kind of exploded diagram uh, look like you're talking about to start, right? And literally you can see that because this wasn't on the original workflow. So I did do a custom analysis for pizza, but what I am doing typically is just like we've literally gone on some tangents here during the conversation, I almost view you being an analyst or a data scientist as doing that ex uh, journey towards exploration, right? Because not only should you be answering that original question, but you're working, this is like you working in a mine, right? So if you're working in a mine, um, and let's say we were down there mining coal and we happen to find some diamonds or some gold, are we literally just gonna take that and be like, this isn't coal and like throw it in the trash, right? That's not gonna happen. We're gonna be excited about that. And I think when we first recognize that that's what it is, then that's where we need to decide, right? I, I like to put those things in containers. And then essentially from there, I decide, hey, should this really become another workflow? Or is it something that should be a macro if I see it conceptually moving forward? So I think going back to the vitamin company, right? Completely opposite of pizza, uh, by the way. When, I, when we go back to that, right? Um, it's interesting because one of... Uh, my coworkers had asked me, oh my gosh, I think I've seen the biggest workflow that I've ever seen. It literally had over a thousand tools on the canvas. And I remember one of my first workflows, <laughs> the SE, like his eyes glazed over because I had about 1400 tools on there. And I kept telling him like, it's breaking, it's so slow. And that was the first time I had ever really done anything. And the reason why it had gotten so big is because I was literally doing in there um, all the parsing I was pulling from, like doing web scraping off of Amazon, pulling data from a third party. I had some internal sources coming. And then what I was doing with that data is I literally said, okay, now let's transform that and then set it together with a packaging algorithm, right? Where I mm -hmm. factored in shipping costs, um, et cetera, and tried to figure out how much would fit in a box, right? So when we start getting to robots, 
this is going to become important. You got the Domino's little robot, right, with the traveling salesman problem. But they're not even thinking about just because you have the traveling salesman problem, you also have, hey, if I keep trying to upsell my orders, do I have the right compartments for that? Or now all of a sudden, does this shrink the route down to I can only do three deliveries instead of, I don't know, six, right? Yeah. Yep. Or 10. And when I look at those types of problems, that's how I see them all kind of combine. And you're right, uh, Michael, I think the two big sources, if you were to start trying to learn about them, are really weather and spatial. And then when we talk about breaking those out, if you can learn to integrate those into some of your um, analysis, I think that's helpful. And then the calendar is huge. So uh, working at like universal, right, when we talk about um, if I were sharing this data with someone, um, something that came up that was huge all the time is uh, their fiscal calendar matched the um, actual um, calendar, right? And why is that so critical? Literally some weeks, there's 53 weeks in the year. And the timing of the holidays is critical because, hey, Christmas and New Year's are really close together. I'm just going to bridge that gap with my vacation, right? And when we look at that, um, what I would do is um, I would always call that out because that would literally define if we were trying to set year over year metrics, wow, last year was uh, $20 billion, right? And we had 53 weeks in the year. Should we be go trying to go for 21? Or is that unrealistic because we may actually feel like we have a little dip because we have a whole week less, right? And that may not sound like it should be big of an impact, but that's literally 2%, right? So that could easily be a swing when you're, let's even call it a million bucks, right? 2% is is literally going to be 20 grand um, that you're talking about. Well, it's just about. like with anything, you know, when you start looking at the macro, you know, level of things, it's, yeah, you don't have enough insights or information to make, you know, realistic decisions. It's like, well, was that 52 weeks, 53 weeks? Was it, you know, um, just one region that was super profitable? Exactly. You don't know. And that's something that um, I'll show you this pizza flow here in a second that I started. But literally, I was curious if we were looking at the tickets, right? Where were most of the meals coming from? And actually, it looks like they were coming from pizza. Yeah. Which is kind of incredible because I was like, okay. Um, when we look at the number of meals, right, if there's 15,000 of these, right, out of 20,000, if you're just looking at these two, and 73% of these were meals, that honestly, in my mind, is crazy. Like, are we missing fries here or something? I, I saw onion rings, but I didn't see any fries. And maybe that's the problem is without fries, nobody cares about uh, <laughs> uh, a combo meal with uh, with a burger, right? They're like, I don't care about onion rings or mozzarella sticks. I wanted the French fries, right, with my drink. So um, it, it proves that Salty really is going to win the day. There you go. And the other data set that we kind of touched on briefly that I was here playing with, um, so this kind of talks about something that you were discussing in regards to pooling data. So I've tried a couple different methods. Um, this is something that I also wanted to touch on. So uh, new to 21.4 if you haven't seen it. So literally here, um, just so you're aware, you can uh, turn on and off containers without having to minimize them anymore. Um, so when we look at this, I can literally uh, hit this button here. My screen's going to go gray because obviously I've got too much stuff up right now. Um, but literally when we look at this, you can uh, just toggle that off, right? And then that'll uh, cascade the highlights there. So I can still see everything grayed out, almost like when you're doing those uh, training sessions, right? Um, and then just kind of work from there. So if I were to to do this, right, I can do that real quick. And now I can still see what's going on, but I'm not concerned about it. Um, I did do the download tool here, and then I had to do some crazy stuff with mods like you were talking about to get leftovers and do the pivots. Um, and what I actually found is uh, with the uh, data world data set, 
I'll bring this up here real quick just because I thought it was so cool. Um, literally, it gave you the choice here to hit the download button or there's the share URL. And when you open this up, literally it just has import pandas and then it gives the exact address, right? So now I can pull the data set live. And that was pretty sweet because if you scroll up here and you see how simple this is, right? So literally I just copied and pasted and then down here, um, I put, ah, there it is, sorry. Uh, down here, I literally put, okay, write out the data frame. Yep. And then I just put that to connection one and boom, out pops my data. Like I barely even broke a sweat, right? And then immediately we get into, okay, now I wanna look at the geography of these locations that they're calling out. So you can see like, um, that's probably Bend, Oregon, right? Shout out to uh, some of our employees who are from Bend. And then you can literally see that geographic dispersion, right? So it looks like apparently nobody has pizza in the Midwest or we don't care about their pizza selections. Um, but it looks <laughs> like East Coast is really rocking the pizza, right? Um, and then when we look at this, I did that and then I gathered another data set. And with these, literally they had a unique ID in the menu. So I only got a couple minutes to play with this, but what I was almost curious about in terms of trying to blend these two sources um, when you look at them was if I were interested in opening up a pizza joint, right? How could I determine what were some of those items that really sold at a higher ticket amount, right? So maybe it's um, like Emil was asking about, right? Um, maybe I need to throw some of the uh, beyond stuff on there, right? Yeah. Or um, here's Robert's question, but will they really charge you for the whole pizza? So in the case of Blaze, no, they don't. But that would be a question that you'd want to think about, right? Like, okay, if I were selling half a pizza, how much should I sell it for? Should it literally be half the price? Or maybe it's like, I don't know, 60%, right? And then technically I'm making extra margin off only having to do half a pizza. Yep. Um, and then I'm getting to upsell maybe some things where I don't have as high a volume, right? So there's kind of a trade-off there. Um, another thing that's cool when we look at this, this is new as well. So you got a recommendation engine here. Um, so literally I can see here's the other tools. And then this is on a per tool basis. So it's literally going to rotate every single time I, I pick a tool, right? It's going to go through and uh, drop another item in here. Um, so that's pretty sweet to kind of see that uh, cascade in and literally it even works with the uh, intelligence suite, right? Um, data health, if you haven't seen it before, um, this will literally take a look at your data set. Um, this is going to normalize it, right, or give you percentages. And then if we were looking at this, it's nice because then it'll give you a report out. So that's just going to give you some of the standard statistics that you'll see down here. But now you can use this data. So if you wanted to kind of dive in or maybe uh, create um, some analytics just based off of that, because you're trying to automate it. Yeah. Um, and then this is nice just to kind of see, right? So especially if you're playing with data that you never learned about, um, you can come in and do just a quick pulse check, um, see if it's good, very good, right? Or in that poor category, so we know to start excluding it. And then how many records are uh, outside of that as well. So pretty sweet stuff. And um, expect to see some more videos coming out um, with us kind of talking about the new features for 21.4, because um, there's quite a few of them, um, especially some API endpoints. Um, that are a little, be a little bit easier to work with than web scraping. So, <laughs> awesome. Man, I think- This is good. Michael, this, is, this session definitely has me hungry now with all this talking. I've got to, I should go and grab a slice, right? There you go. <laughs> awesome. So thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you, Michael, for uh, being part of the session. And I can't wait to see uh, you're going to be on three charts at 3 p.m. tomorrow um, talking about pizza as well and then even carrying that data forward to um, the, the next session. Um, so guys, don't forget to check that out. And then as always, feel free to sign up for um, Transform Tuesdays. 
um, I'll throw that here in the chat. Um, that way, if you guys want to sign up for a session, um, you can do so. And we would love to have you as guest speakers and look out for us next week um, as we dive into pets as our next topic. Awesome. Thank you, All everyone. Right. Thanks, everyone.